Greetings, church, and all the saints in our Sunday school class. What a wonderful group of people that is to share and um, just pray together and learn from one another. And um, it's just a blessing to be here and an honor to be able to, to give Jesus' word to you today. Um, today, the uh, focus is the glory of the resurrection. That's what I was assigned by Wagdi, and um, he sent me all kinds of uh, resources and and uh, information that I could have put together and done it for him. What he gave me and what John Foster had, I could have put them together and been done in an hour or two. But I think the I think those messages were for those people at that time. So I chucked it all and and uh, let the Spirit lead me to present something a little bit different, a little different focus for um, today, but it still points to Jesus. So I hope you're blessed. I've had a wonderful week in preparing. Um, I just, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, please. Jesus, this is the day that you have made. This was the day that you planned from the beginning, Lord. This is the day that Jesus reigns with you sits at your right side, Lord. This is the day that all of our sins are forgiven, Lord. This is the day that we know the hope that is within us, Lord. I ask that you um, give me the right words to speak, your words, Lord, and um, that may we all be encouraged to be able to show the world the hope that is within us also, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, um, slide... We can go right into the slides now, okay? Um, I, th I decided to show where the Old Testament um, points to Jesus and his resurrection so that we can see the whole, f the whole purpose that God had from the beginning. So we're just gonna look at some uh, resurrection scriptures from the Old Testament. Then we will um, uh, go into the New Testament, and you'll see where I'm going as, as we go along. Um, but most of this is all scripture instruction today, not my, not my thoughts. We have the first slide here is Psalm 1610. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful Holy One see decay. It depends on your, your uh, translation, what you use. So it says right there, David was saying, he, under, he, you know, foreseeing that uh, Jesus would not decay. So, in the next slide, uh, Isaiah 26, 19. This is all of Israel, the, the people of Israel. This is their, their uh, uh, praise. Our dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Again, this is following Jesus' resurrection, that the dead who are asleep will arise. So again, we have the resurrection following Jesus' resurrection. And um, so the bodies will be able to be seen by others. Um, uh, Daniel 12, 2. And many, or all of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is more a reference to the end days, but uh, as we saw in Revelation, actually. But again, we have the dead, those who are asleep, arising in bodily form. Psalm 49, 15. God will ransom, redeem, or redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Another reference to uh, uh, resurrection there. God will do this for him. And if he will do it for him, he loves us so much, he'll do it for us too. And Psalm 69, 19 through 20, God who is like you, you have made me see many troubles and calamities, will revive me again from the depths of the earth. You will bring me up again. Again, that was David speaking. So you can see those who fall asleep will not remain there forever. Um, and I, I just... I think those are all showing us that what happened, oh, I don't know, 1,500 years later, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, it came to true. Ezekiel 37, 12 through 14. 
Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Again, we're seeing God promising to raise us up together with Jesus. And um, I was struggling with this about these bodies that were being raised up again. And I thought, well, what happens there? Okay, they get raised up. I mean, what happens? And Wagdi was able to spend time with me last night and said, the scriptures don't say. But they are saying right now that this is probably just shows the people, as we will see in the New Testament, it's proof that God was able to do that for those who were on earth, be able to see the um, uh, those who had fallen asleep were alive again. And uh, while this is referring to a spiritual awakening, spiritual birth, or um, uh, we already know that they, in spirit they went to heaven, but but this is showing those who are who were um, on the earth that they that Jesus did that God did raise them from the dead also. And then Isaiah 53, this is the one that's common to all of us. We all know this one, but this is literally the, the, the prophecy of Jesus himself. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But God, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep for her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off, cut out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Wow. Um, this morning when I was praying over this and just over the glory of uh, uh, Good Friday and the resurrection, it just really hit me hard what he did for me, Ron Wilbur. How he, he didn't just bear my humiliations. He didn't just bear my sins. Just for one other person to bear my sins would be unbearable probably. And Jesus, who knew no sin, took all that on him for Ron Wilbur. Now you multiply that times 10 billion people. Your worst sin that you ever committed, the worst time when you were found out. And Jesus, who totally innocent, accepted that and took it on for himself. Now you take 10 million times their whole lives, say 70, 80 years of sins, and he took all of that at once. I was like in near tears imagining that burden that he took. And um, he did that for each one of us. Wow. 
But the glory of it all is, it is finished. And uh, today we can uh, celebrate. And um, it's just, it was just a wonderful time this morning. I hope you have time today, if you haven't done so, to just spend time with the Lord, just thanking Him for His resurrection and how we can claim victory in all things. Because, church, it is finished. Okay. Um, next, what I did was I took... Um, Hold on, I gotta get my own slideshow up. What I did was I took the uh, Old Testament characters that were in the Bible and I just compared them to Jesus. I think we have heard those before. So I, the first one I was doing was Jonah. We did this a couple months ago for Jonah chapter two. We compared Jonah to, um, to Jesus himself also. And um, if you recall, when we talked about what he went through also. Uh, and we just compared them. Um, I'm not gonna reread them because we already did it two months ago. But um, remarkable uh, representation of future rep representation of Jesus' coming. It's just a revelation of Jesus even before he was revealed. Okay, but the people didn't know that. And then we go on to um, Joseph talking to Wagdi last night. He likes this one. I like the next one I'm going to talk about, but Wagi was telling me how this is the Jesus of the Old Testament. Uh, we know that Jesus was sold for pieces of silver. He was betrayed by his brothers, actually. That's not even in here. He was betrayed completely. He was stripped of his robe. He was falsely accused by the uh, official's wife. Um, but he remained faithful, he was thrown into prison, um, and we all know what happened eventually. And he eventually sat at the right hand of the Pharaoh, just like Jesus is doing now. And, um, and then people came to him and bowed before him. We already know that. It was his own people that ended up doing that. Um, so it's just another representation of Jesus that maybe if we aren't studying, that we aren't going to see. But all of this is foretelling Jesus. Which brings us to Daniel. I did a comparison here like I do. I like to do, I like to do you know, those tables and charts to show it to you. I'm not going to read the Jesus side. But in Daniel, um, uh, let's see, is it chapter 6, I believe. Um, in verse 3, it said there was an excellent spirit was in him, just as, in the, as the same was with Jesus. And also in verse 3, the king sought to set him over the whole realm. But the governors and the leaders, in the, in the Old Testament they use the word satraps, and that's a nice fancy word for governors, I think, as that when I studied it. So I just called them leaders because they were jealous of Darius being set over them. They did not like that in the least. So uh, uh, they tried to accuse him, and they found that he was guiltless before man and God. And it says, this, I love that, continuing in verse 3, neither was there error or fault found in him. Uh, so they, as you remember, that they, they created a, uh, a law. They went to the king and had him declare a law that no one could pray to anyone but to the king. And of course, the king in his vanity, Darius, um, in his vanity, accepted that. He thought it was a good thing. And, um, and of course, we know that Daniel went ahead and prayed anyway. And not only that, he did it like he always did. He didn't hide it. He was not ashamed of his father. And so he prayed on his knees three times a day, and they were, and they were just waiting. The governors and the leaders were just waiting. Whereas the leaders used spies to find on David. These guys were so desperate, they spied themselves. So... So they had Daniel arrested, and his charge, he was treasonous against the king because he was making petitions to God. As, whereas, you know, the, 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 the Pharisees and the scribes were saying that Jesus was, was um, claiming to be king as a rival to Caesar. And of course, they're still, it's still doing the same thing here. So Daniel was brought before Darius, just like Jesus was brought before Pilate. And... Um, 
Pilate found no fault in him, and Darius, knowing he was trapped, said on his heart, after he knew what had been what had been determined, he set on his heart to deliver him, and he labored all night, all day, trying to find a way to help Daniel um, uh, be released from this uh, sentence of death. And even Pilate did the same, tried to offer different alternatives to them. But Darius was afraid of the governors and the rulers. And so when he was arrested, he received immediate judgment. No trial, went straight to it. But Darius was powerless because he was bound by his own decree. And I think what's really significant here, though God could have delivered Jesus, he chose not to because in John 3, 16, he gave his own son. Now, since the entire Old Testament had been leading to this time, there was no possibility that God was going to deliver his son from this because it had already been planned since time began. So while Darius tried, God didn't, didn't need to because he knew the plan. So Daniel was cast into the lion's den, just as the cross was, was um, Jesus' sentence. So while Daniel faced death for the human sinfulness and pride, Jesus actually experienced it. And just like Jesus, the governors and the satraps demanded a stone be brought and laid over the mouth of the den. I don't know why you would need that, considering it was deep and the lions, the hungry lions were down there. Why would you need a stone put over that? It's just foolishness. It's just like, why did you need to put a, a stone across the tomb? He was God. He could have, when he reappeared to the disciples, he went through the door. He didn't need to open up a, roll back the tomb. Every All the naysayers say, oh, he, he couldn't have had the strength to roll open the tomb, but the, the stone, he was God. He didn't have to worry about a stone. That couldn't hold Jesus. Oh, anyway. Um, so they, they, they put the stone over there. And where the mockers said, let God deliver him for Jesus, the king said the same thing. Although he did it in a plea, he will deliver you. He's trusted in he knew there was something about this God that Daniel uh, honored. And so early the next morning, early, very early in the morning, he went and hastily to the den. And there an angel appeared in the den. And when he called out to Daniel, he found out, he realized that Daniel was alive. And his king was exceedingly glad, just like the women were exceedingly joyful. And as he came out, they were vindic he was vindicated and exalted throughout the kingdom. Daniel was taken up. Jesus was taken up. And um, his plotters and families, and all of them were actually cast into the den. And the neat thing is, they were dead before they hit the floor. They, the, the lions were so hungry. They didn't eat for Daniel, eat Daniel, but they were torn up lip, limb from limb before they ever hit the floor, all of them. That's an amazing uh, vindication and revenge, if you want to call it that, the revenge of the Lord. Um, what it says here for Jesus, his plotters would eventually be desolated. Um, and that is simply referring to, um, uh, I think, uh, later in after, um, let me see, it says, um, I wrote a note here, King Antioch, Antiochus Epiphanes of, of Syria would desecrate the, uh, the temple in 168 AD. He turned it into a shrine of Zeus and even sacrificed pigs on it. So what the, what the, uh, what the scribes and Pharisees were trying to preserve eventually was, uh, was uh, their, their plan failed eventually, even though it took longer to get there. Um, so Daniel's salvation empowered Darius, gave him the strength to uh, go against the leaders and it resulted in God being worshiped throughout the kingdom. And his enemy's actions actually increased um, Daniel's influence throughout the kingdom. He did sit at the king's right hand. Um, Joseph did sit at Pharaoh's right hand. So it worked. 
And um, so, which takes us to Daniel 6, 25 through 27. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth. May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Wow. Now, I'm going to read it again. And I want you to put Jesus' name in there. Okay. Every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Jesus, for he is the living God. He endures forever. Jesus' kingdom will not be destroyed. Jesus' dominion will never end, for he rescues and saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And he rescued us from the power of death. Wow. If that isn't a precursor to Jesus pointing us to the New Testament and God's purpose, nothing will. Now, I am not going to go into the crucifixion and the resurrection story. We know that very, very well. You are saints in God's eyes. We don't need to, we are moving on to other things. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to read, like I said, God's word is more powerful than anything I can say. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It might be the most powerful chapter in the entire Bible, or at least in the New Testament, or at least in Corinthians. It doesn't matter, but what, I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the translation of the message rather than the NIV or the King James or anything like that. The reason being, as you listen, and hopefully you're reading along if you can, or you can read along in your translation and listen to this one, or get on your... Uh, computers and find the res find the uh, translation. What I like about it is it makes it more simple language, and it it's like a personal testimony. As you're reading this, you can take every one of these sentences and just make it yours. I love this uh, translation. Um, so, without further ado, let's get started, friends. Let me go over the message with you one final time. This message that I proclaimed and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was a real thing and not a passing fancy, that you're in this for good and holding fast. I'm gonna stop there for a second. I read a, um, I read a devotion by Oswald Chambers this week, which was, really good when the when the uh, three disciples observed um, Jesus on the Mount of Configuration with uh, Abraham and Elijah or Moses and Elijah notice that these were spirit beings yet the disciples immediately knew who they were they couldn't have known what they looked like physically so I think um, that's another indication that um, um, when we are we're going to be identified by our spirit beings also, and uh, it's just going to be another um, indicator of the resurrection for, for us too. Um, Jesus said, be quiet. Don't say anything about this because you don't understand yet. I say that, and what, what, what uh, Oswald Chambers was saying was, he said, so many people like to give their mountaintop experience, and they give their testimony. Jesus is telling them they couldn't give a testimony to this because they didn't understand or they weren't exemplifying what that was all about. So Oswald Chambers said, there's so many of us that we have that saving moment or we have that God moment. And we've all heard testimonies from people that aren't demonstrating what you think. So um, Jesus wants us to be quiet. If we aren't walking the walk, we can't talk the talk. We can't give this false image of who we are in Christ 
because we have a great story and everybody has a great story and we've heard them heard great stories just be quiet till you know what you're talking about till you've been till his glory has been revealed to you um, so I thought that was very significant on that that instruction while I may have many good stories and testimonies I need to be careful that my walk is is a testimony to that more than the story itself verse 3 the first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me, that the Messiah died for our sins, exactly as the scripture tells it, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Again, exactly as scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest followers, and later to more than 500 of his followers, followers all at the same time most of them still around, although few have since died, that he spent time with James and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him, and that he finally presented himself alive to me. It was fitting that I bring up the rear. It's fitting that Ron Wilbur brings up the rear, but he did reveal himself to me too. I don't deserve to be included in that inner circle, as you well know, having spent all those early years trying my best to stamp God's church right out of existence. Now, though I said he revealed himself to me, that doesn't make me an apostle. I'm just simply a disciple doing my best through the strength of the Holy Spirit. But because God was so gracious, so very generous, here I am. Here Wagdi is, here John Foster is, here's Pastor Mike is, because God is so dear gracious. I'm not about to let his grace go to waste. Haven't I worked hard trying to do more than any of the others? Even then, my work didn't amount to all that much. It was God giving me the work to do. God giving me the energy to do it. So whether you heard it from me or from those others, it's all the same. We spoke God's truth and you entrusted our lives. I so want to read this in the present tense, but I'm letting God do the talking. Verse 12, now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you became believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there is no such thing as a resurrection? We've just shown that there is. If there is no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies before God. All these affidavits we pass on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications, if there is no resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died in hoping in Christ and resurrection, because they're already in their graves. If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a short, few short years, we're a pretty sorry lot. And I think in the original translation it says we are to be pitied most of all. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. Again, leaving the cemeteries coming up in bodily form, again, a testimony to those on the earth that God can raise from the dead, that he can resurrect lives. There is a night, verse 21, there's a nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everybody dies in Adam. Everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first then those with him at his coming. The grand consummation when, after crushing the opposition, he hands over the kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down, and the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid low one and all. He walked all over them. When scripture says that he walked all over them, it's obvious he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the sun will step down, taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. 
Why do you think people offer themselves to be baptized for those already in the grave? There is no chance of resurrection for our course if God's power stops at the cemetery gates. Why do we keep doing things that suggest he's going to clean the place out someday, pulling everyone up on their feet alive? And why do you think I'm risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of your resurrection and mine, as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beasts at Ephesus, hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not in your life. It's resurrection, resurrection, always resurrection that underguards what I do and say the way I live. If there's no resurrection, we eat, we drink, and the next day we die. And that's all there is to it. But don't fool yourselves. Don't let yourselves be poisoned by this anti-resurrection talk. If you listen to it, that bad company will ruin good manners every time. So think straight. Awaken to the holiness of life. No more playing fast and loose with these resurrection facts. Ignorance of God is a luxury you can't afford in times like these. And I think we can certainly say that right now. Aren't you embarrassed that you've let this kind of thing go on as long as you have? That you've sat silent when the Holy Spirit in us is crying out? Some skeptic is sure to ask, show me how resurrection works. Give me a diagram. Draw me a picture. What does this resurrection body look like? If you look at this question slowly, closely, you realize how absurd that is. There are no diagrams for this kind of thing. We do have a parallel experience in gardening. You plant a dead seed, soon there's a flourishing plant. There's no visual likeness between seed and plant. You could never guess what a tomato would look like by looking at a tomato seed. When we plant in the soil and what grows out of it, don't look, oh, I'm sorry. When we plant in the soil and what grows out of it, they don't look anything alike. The dead body that we bury in the ground and the resurrection body that comes from it will be dramatically different. Um, yeah. You will notice that the variety of bodies is stunning. Just as there are different kinds of seeds, there are different kinds of bodies. Humans, animals, birds, fish, each unprecedented in its form. You get a hint at the diversity of resurrection glory by looking at the diversity of bodies not only on earth but in the skies sun, moon, stars, all these varieties of beauty and brightness. And we're only looking at pre-resurrection seeds. Who can imagine what resurrection plants will be like? I asked that one time um, in a Sunday school class. And if you remember Jim, um, blah, 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 drawing a blank, um, uh, he said, it's not anything that I can do that's gonna make that change. It's gonna be all the Holy Spirit. So while we're thinking, am I a good representation in heaven the way I am? Of course not. Of course not. But we have a Holy Spirit that's going to resurrect us in, into God's glory. So don't, don't worry, guys. God is, God is capable. Um, this image of planting a dead seed and raising a live plant is a mere sketch at best. But perhaps it will help in approaching the mystery of the resurrection body. But only if you keep in mind when we're raised... We're raised for good, alive forever. The corpse that's planted is no beauty, but when it's raised, it's glorious. Put in the ground weak, it comes up powerful. The seed sown is natural. The seed grown is supernatural. Same seed, same body, but what a difference from when it goes down in physical mortality to when it's raised up in spiritual immortality. We follow this sequence in scripture. The first Adam received life. The last Adam is a life-giving spirit. Physical life comes first, then spiritual. A firm base shaped from the earth. A final completion coming out of heaven. The first man was made out of earth, and people since then are earthy. The second man was made out of heaven, and people now can be heavenly. In the same way that we worked from our earthly origins, let's embrace our heavenly ends. I need to emphasize, friends, that our natural earthy lives don't lie in themselves. Lead us by their very nature into the kingdom of God. Their very nature is to die. So how could they naturally end up in the life kingdom? But let me tell you something wonderful, a mystery I probably 
we'll never fully understand. We're not going to die, but we are all going to be changed. You hear a blast to end all blasts from a trumpet, and in the time that you look up and blink your eyes, it's over. On signal from that trumpet from heaven, the dead will be up and out of their graves beyond the reach of death, never to die again. At the same moment and in the same way, we'll be all be changed. In the resurrection scheme of things, this has to happen. Everything perishable, taken off the shelves and replaced by the imperishable. This mortal replaced by the immortal. Then the saying will be true. Death swallowed by triumphant life. Oh, who got the last word, oh death? Oh death, who's afraid of you now? It was sin that made death so frightening and law code guilt that gave sin its leverage, its destructive power. But now in single glorious stroke of life, all three, sin, guilt, death, are gone. The gift of our master, Jesus Christ. Thank God. With all this going on for us, my dear friends, stand your ground. Don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do is a, time, is a waste of time or effort. Okay. Wow. Go back and read it for yourselves in whatever translation you are. Put it in the present tense. Uh, put your name where you can in that reading. And I think it's going to give you a new perspective on what God has done for us. Um, I'm going to close with a little bit of um, uh, more of the story. If you, on the next slide, you'll see Sunday School and Stephen. A few years ago, we did a study on the Holy Spirit. I had asked the question one time, why do we always pray to God and Jesus, but we don't pray to the Holy Spirit like we do them? And we began a study on it that Wagdi led, and it was wonderful. Well, one day in Sunday school, a man showed up. This is when we were over in the uh, where the youth center is, or was. A man then showed up, his name was Stephen, and um, he listened to our lesson. And he participated, but at the very end, he said, I don't understand all of this. People are always talking about how they'd love to, to be with Jesus and to live under his instruction. And he said, but that was Jesus with us, God with us. He says, now we have the God in us. We have the Holy Spirit. He goes, what's better than that? And when he said it, I was like amazed. We have God in us, class. We have God in us, not with us. He's in us. He's our guide. And I was so excited. I thought, I got to get to know this guy. I was really excited to see him. And I wanted to meet him after church and talk to him. Do you know that man never showed up again? Never saw him again in our church. So in my own belief, please don't shoot me for it. I believe that was an angel sent by God for our class at that time. His name was Stephen. So... So, who is God in us? He's our constant companion. He's the spirit that indwells in us. He abides in us as much as we allow him. He would, I can't imagine if we completely abided in us and we in him, there'd be no end to what we could do in, in the name of God. He is our constant comforter. Where else do we turn? Because there's things that can happen that man can't comfort, but he can. He's our guide. He cannot leave us because he was, he was promised to be sent to us. Jesus was not a liar. He said, I will send the comforter to you. So we have him. It's, he, Jesus said it. We have him. Um, now, I went ahead and um, I really like the Jehovah names. And this is what is in us, people. He is the Jehovah Shammah. He is my presence, not our presence. He's my presence. That is God in me, Jehovah Shammah. He is my Jehovah Shalom, my peace. He is my dad, mine, Ron Wilbur's dad, Jehovah Abba, my father. He is Jehovah Nisi, my banner. He goes before us, which is what's so cool about Gideon. When he went to battle with 300 men, he built an altar before then. He knew he was going to have the battle fight that was almost unwinnable. And his altar was, he built an altar to not glory and mighty warrior, not great battle, not great shield, but Jehovah Nisi. He took the, he took the Jehovah God 
in front of them, not anything else. So when we go out in the world, we don't need anything but our Jehovah Nisi leading the way before us. He is my Jehovah Rapha, my healer. He is my Jehovah, I gotta say it John's way, Yire, my provider. He provides us physically. We always think about money and the finances, but he, he protects me physically and spiritually. He's my Jehovah Ra. I didn't know that one before today, my shepherd. He is my Jehovah Elohim. And there is the power and the might that we need to walk in this world. All of these things is God in us. Look at what we have in, inside of us every single day. And how much do we really honor that on a daily basis? What he is doing for us 24 seven on top of Jesus interceding for us 24 seven. We have God in us constantly doing his very best to make us his disciples, his apostles, his children. So how do we apply all this? This is the resurrection story. This is the application of what we need to do in this world. If you have joy in the Lord, you gotta celebrate that today. Sing it, say it, proclaim it. And if you love Jesus, tell the world. Doesn't matter what people say. Just tell them. Whoever's in front of you, if they're struggling, tell them. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, then be the salt. Be the light of Jesus. For Jesus is the salt. Jesus is the light. It's not your light. It's his light. He is the one that gives us the, the flavoring, the salt. So if I'm doing it in Ron's salt, Ron's light, that becomes an ego, prideful thing. So I'm, I am the light of Jesus in the world. You are the light of Jesus in the world. Um, and here's something else that I always, I tell all my students at school, happy people make other people happy, but joyful people bring other people to Jesus. So that is our calling. Give them joy, class. Bring them to Jesus. There is no joy apart from him. Father, there is no end to your instruction. There is no end to your glory. There is no end to your revelation. There is no end to your resurrection because it's happening daily, Lord. Father, we right now, this church seeks your face above all things. We seek your guidance in this world in the midst of what we're experiencing, Lord. We seek your assurance of our salvation, or your assurance of our spending eternity with you. Father, you're such a merciful, graceful God, great, graceful God. Um, there is no end to your love for us. Help us to remember that in our own homes, which is where we are 24 seven for some of us. Help us to be that joy in front of our wives, in front of our husbands. Help us to be the example for our children. Father, we thank you for the time that we've spent here today. We, um, but this is not a Sunday lesson. This is a life lesson. Father, help me tomorrow wake up and give and praise your name even stronger than today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for listening, those that you endured to the end. <laughs> we thank you for your time. We thank you for this church. We thank you for your participation in our Sunday school class. It truly is a uh, wonderful place to be from 9.30 to 10.15 or each Sunday. Um, thank you and may God bless. Amen.